Petroleum, created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 83. Be on the lookout for Bronco artists passing as a Baron von Bodenthal, described as medium height, wears a monocle, speaks with a foreign accent, that's all. Rolls and clips. Tonight, hundreds of police cars are patrolling dark streets in California and Arizona cities, listening intently for the police radio. When the emergency call comes, and it comes many times every night, down goes the throttle to the floorboard, the sirens scream, and Rio Grande cracked gasoline rushes the police to the rescue. No other gasoline will meet emergencies so well as Rio Grande cracked because no other gasoline is made in the West by the patented Sinclair cracking process. Tests have been made by scores of city chemists to find which gasoline gives best results in emergency motors. And Rio Grande has won the test in Los Angeles, in Maricopa County, Arizona, in Fresno, in Oakland, in Berkeley. In fact, everywhere it is sold, Rio Grande cracked gasoline powers more police cars fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment than any other brand. Rio Grande Crack has been chosen by these cities not only for its exceptional speed and power, but because city records of automobile operating costs prove that this unusual gasoline actually gives many more miles to the gallon. Even at lowest cut prices, no uncracked gasoline gives as many miles per dollar as Rio Grande Crack. Why don't you use the same gasoline that experts specify for their finest car? You can enjoy police car performance in your own car if you just ask your independent dealer for Rio Grande cracked gasoline. And now it is our privilege once more to present Chief James E. Davis, of the Los Angeles Police Department, Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. A constant public menace which your police find difficult to combat is the operations of confidence men and bunco artists. The world is full of slickers whose philosophy contains no word for work. They are wed to the idea that the less wary should pay their way. Their victims, innocent, gullible citizens who believe in their fellow man, more often than not, swallow their pride, take their loss, and say nothing about it because of fear of ridicule. Hence, the policeman's problem. This type of offender could be more completely dealt with if only the citizen who has become a victim of his guile would promptly report him to the police. As you will see in this story you're about to hear, the Baron soon walked into the law's arms after his victim had gotten enough courage to report his gullibility to the authorities. It is several years ago in Vienna. A seedily dressed little man sidles over the golden plush threshold of the Kaiserhof Café. A waiter approaches him. You were looking for someone, sir? For you, Heinrich. Carl, when did they release you? Just yesterday. I walked all the way from the prison. Oh, you should not have come back here. Yeah, yeah, I know, but I had to see you. Tell me, my friend, did they treat you well in the prison? Like a pig. Bread and water and turnips. And all because the Countess von Stormhoff left her purse at the table and I was tempted to remove the contents. Three years for that. Well, it is the law. And the Petron need not have turned me in. He could have overlooked it. Oh, it does no good to be bitter, Carl. You can get occupation somewhere else. You're very good, Vader. Vader? No longer will I be a Vader. Well, what do you propose to do? I'm going to live. Consider, Highness. With a monocle in my eye, 
And an afternoon coat. Could I not touch as a gentleman? Would I not look the same as any of these people here? Yeah, yeah. Perhaps you would. Certainly I have a manner. One cannot be a waiter in the Kaiserhof Cafe without a manner. True. And this scar on my cheek, where that Swabian dishwasher hit me with a plate that time, would that not pass as a gentleman's saber scar received in a student duel at Heidelberg? Yeah, it might. But not in Vienna. I'm not going to remain in Vienna. I'm going to travel. And finally, that is why I've come here to you, my best friend. Why is that, Carl? I will need some money to buy a wardrobe and a ticket. Enough money, let us say, to get me to Paris. Oh, I have not much money, Carl. You have enough, Heinrich, to lend me some. Yeah, but my Lena and the children, it would not be fair to them. It is an investment, Heinrich. We are going into business together. The money I gleaned from gullible parvenus, I shall give you a half. Think of it, Carl. For a few paltry shillings, you will have hundreds. You can quit this menial task, open your own restaurant. Think of it, Heinrich. A little place of your own, where you can be your own. afternoon, Madame Turin. Mais not du tout, Colonel. It is you who are good to come. Always you are welcome in the home of Celeste de Rain. Ah, Madame, your words, the look in your eyes, gives me hope that someday... Oui, mon Colonel? Please, call me Carl. Carl, oui. Carl. And you are staying? Mm. No, no, no. I, I cannot. It would not be fair. These two weeks since I have met you have been the happiest in my life, but... Alas. But what, girl? Mon Dieu, speak. I, too, have been happy in this knowing you. A real gentilhomme. Ah, oh, if you could only know the life I have led. Those unhappy years of mariage to Monsieur Derain, a bourgeois. Figurez-vous, a type who devastated that within my veins runs the blood of Napoleon. Napoleon, le fille, that is. Uh, yeah, I know. Yours has been an unhappy lot, and it flatters me while it grieves me to be forced to add to your unhappiness. Carl, what are you saying? Celeste, I must go away. No, 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 mon ami. Do not go away. Do not leave me. I have not told you before, but I think it is only fair that you know I am on a secret mission. Yeah? A secret mission? Yes, I am on the business of his grace, the Archduke Otto. If I am successful... I shall place him on the throne of Austria. Marvel. When I think what that will mean to the royalist cause in France. Mm, yeah, exactly. My mission is a difficult one, however. It, uh, it is beset with many annoying obstacles. Oh, if I could but help. Yeah, there is little one can do. Yeah, I, I will get it somehow. Get what, Carl? Money. It will be necessary to finance the coup d'etat. Money? But then, mon ami, I can help. I have plenty of money. Monsieur Derain made millions. Manufacturing bed springs or whatever it was. I beg you to let me help. Uh, no, no, Celeste. I, I couldn't think of it. Uh, no, it would be quite impossible. When I am successful, when the Emperor Otto sits crowned in Vienna, I want to come back to you without a sense of obligation. Mais j'insiste, Carl. It is a privilege. Oh, that at last I can help the re-establishment of the monarchy. It has been the greatest ambition of my life to be able to do such a thing. How much do you need, Carl? Oh, really, Celeste, I, I cannot... Asse, asse, here. I write you the check for one million francs. Uh, uh, a million francs? Voilà, mon cher. Oh, royalty. Oh, but Celeste... Mais c'est toi. Take it. Oh, well, very well. And, uh, and now, Celeste, I, I must sleep you, but uh, only until I have placed the Archduke upon the imperial throne of Austria. Oh, Miss Heatherstone, this mild English summer has done wonders for me. Oh, I feel like a new man. You look much better than you did when you came down here to Shepton Heath a month ago. Oh, I, 
I've only read that my recovery was due more to the quiet summer air, the sweet smelling roses in this garden, and the pale blue sky, or to the quiet intelligence of your soul, the understanding in your eyes, the beautiful friendship you have given me. Oh, Professor Rainstein. Bitte, please call me Carl. Do you think it would be quite proper? I'm sure it would, Mary. Oh, Carl. Oh, if life could but go on like this, if one were not impelled to achieve, to grind out the grains of one's soul in the mortar and pestle of ambition. Oh, this is madness, Mary. Why? My experiment. I must complete my experiment. My laboratory in London calls, and if it costs my life, I shall go back and finish my work. Oh, your life? Yes, Mary, and it may cost me my life. The fumes from the chemicals in which I am working are insidious, deadly. They kill slowly. That is why I had to come down here to Shepton Heath to gain back a foothold on a life for just a little longer. Oh, Carl, no. And now I must go back to that foul-smelling laboratory to continue my work, to push back the frontiers of human knowledge one little step further. Oh, Carl, you are a great man. No. When I was a little girl here in this vicarage, my father used to sit with me in this very garden and tell me of the great scientists who had given their lives to humanity. I learned to love them. Oh, and to think that I've finally met one. And learned to love you? Oh, Carl. My life has been so lonely in this old victory since my father passed on, living here alone with the memory of him. Oh, no, I can't bear to think of the friendship we have had coming to an end. Oh, you give me hope, Mary. You give me a reason to want to live. Perhaps, who knows, perhaps my experiment will not kill me. Perhaps someday when it is finished, I, I can come back to you. Oh, I pray to God that you will. I shouldn't have said that. My goodness, I'm acting like a young girl. To me, you are a young girl, Mary. A young girl who must be protected from life. Tell me, Lipchen, uh, you, uh, you have not much uh, money, have you? Well, my father left me a hundred a year. Oh, as I thought well. Here, Mary, is something I want you to have. What is it? A copy of my will. I have some property in Austria, a villa near Vienna, another near Salzburg, and some fairly valuable books and paintings. I've had my solicitor make this will out in your favor. If I by completing my experiment, I want you to have all that I possess. Oh, no, Carl, I couldn't. It wouldn't be right. I've done nothing for you. You have given me hope. You have given me something for which to live an impetus to go back and complete my experiment, if I only can. But of course you can. With your genius... No, it is not that. Uh, working with the precious materials I am, I, I, I may run out before the experiment is concluded. Can't you get more? No, oh, I can and I cannot. At the present, my affairs in Vienna are so tangled that I may not be able to get my hand on some ready cash. Then, Carl, would you let me help? You? Oh, no, no, I... I could not do that. Well, it wouldn't be much, but I could possibly realize on some of my inheritance. Oh, it would be a privilege to help a man of science. Oh, no, no, it's, it's impossible. And it would make me feel better about your will. Please let me help, Carl. Well, since you place it on that basis... But... I'll see my solicitor tomorrow. Oh, well, there is no immediate hurry. If I need your help, I will write to you. And if I survive my experiment... I will write to you to come to me. Oh, Carl, I... I love you. And it is not long before Carl Villingen, the ex-waiter of the Kaiserhof Cafe, alias Professor Rengstein, who writes gullible Mary Heatherston for fun. Meanwhile, in the office of the Paris Tourette. And you give this Colonel von Mohrenberg one million francs, madame? Mais oui, one million francs. So that he could place the Archduke Otto on the Austrian throne. What? Mais je vous dis. So that he could place the Archduke Otto on the Austrian throne. Ha. 
but the Archduke Otto, he remains in Belgium. Where, for the good of the peace of Europe, he had best remain. And my million francs and Colonel von Marenberg have disappeared. Madame, do you realize you have placed yourself in a grave situation? I realize that I want my million francs back. Ah, more than your million francs are at stake. There is truth in what you say. If you have really contributed to the Austrian wireless cause, you have become an enemy of thought. What? Madame, we must investigate this matter further. And in the meantime, you will be held. Held? Mais pourquoi? On suspicion of treason. No, no, no. I have not been a traitor to La France. Mais c'est fou, c'est Madame, oui, moi, je... that remains to be seen. This matter is out of my hands. That's clearly an incident for the court of <laughs> Diplomatic dispatches between Paris and Vienna quickly reveal the fraud, and Madame Durand, sadder and wiser, is released to go her chauvinistic way. But by this time, spinster Mary Heatherstone, puzzled that her beloved scientist's letters have ceased to arrive, sets out on a journey to London, which lands her finally in the chief of inspector's office in Scotland Yard. I went to the address here in London to which I'd been writing him. I found it to be a bake shop which sells Vienna bread. Hmm, I see. Oh, I can't understand it. The bake shop, they knew no Professor Rangstein. Oh, I wish you'd try to find him. I'm afraid he's met with some accident, been a victim of foul play. You say you've been sending him money. Yes. You see, he was completing a great and important experiment. Oh, what kind of an experiment? Why, uh, I come to think of it, he never did say. I thought so. And how much money did you send him? Several hundred pounds. Almost all of my inheritance. We were going to be married, you see. Yes, I imagine so. He even made me the beneficiary. Of his will? Why, how did you know? I've handled such cases before, Miss Heatherston. This isn't a missing person's case. What is it, then? A pure case of fraud. You've been built out of several hundred pounds by an imposter. <gasps> Quick, Sergeant, bring some water. This young lady's painter. Meanwhile, living right royally on Madame Durand's million sign and Miss Heatherston's several hundred pounds, Carl Billington travels to Buenos Aires, lives well for several months, and then his funds getting low, visits a certain dirty office along the waterfront. In the beer, Senor, I understand you are very clever. Clever? Other what? Shall we say, poor Jerry? I do not think it would be wise to see it too loudly, senor. I have no desire to. What would the senor like to have accomplished? I wish to enter the United States. From which country? From Austria. Yeah, let me see. Hey, see, hey, that can be arranged. And under what name? The Baron Karl von Badenthal. The Baron Karl von Badenthal. An excellent name. Mm. I return at the same time tomorrow, Baron, and I shall have a beautiful Austrian passport ready and visa for you. Without a... oh, this is a little different. 
When one of your motion picture millionaires visited Vienna last year, I had the pleasure of meeting him. We talked of my scenario, and he offered me $15,000 for it. Oh, yeah? Of course, this is in confidence. Oh, sure, sure. Herman? Yes, please. Arnold, did you see the story in this morning's examiner? What story? About the Baron von Badenkopf. What about him? Well, he's landed in New York and he's coming to Hollywood to sell a scenario. Seeing Kavitana, the Baron von Badenkopf is coming right here to Hollywood. Well, whatever. Ah, uh, what of it? When I was a boy in Austria, there were some von Badenkopfs who had a castle near our village. Well? Maybe this man belongs to the same family. Maybe you could tell me of the homeland. Now, listen, Herman. You have no right to bother a baron. Your people were just honest villagers. Ah, yeah, but this is America. And Austria is no longer under the emperor. Here, under the heavy quality. Surely I can talk to a baron. In this country, am I not a baron? I have made my fortune. I, too, have wealth and power. Well, what do you propose to do about this baron? I shall meet him as soon as he gets to Hollywood. Though unknown to him, Spider Carl's carefully spun net had already caught a fly. The gullible press gives the Baron columns of space on his trip across the country, and so it is that he's hardly settled in his room in a Hollywood hotel when the phone rings. Hello? I never like to mix friendship and business, but uh, 
Uh, Herman, there is one solution. What's that? I could take you in as a partner. But uh, how, Carl? I will share half and half on the $15,000 I will get for my scenario if you can lend me enough money to get back to Vienna. <laughs> That's more than fair. You, you're being too generous. You are my best friend, Herman. Ah, all right. How much will you need? About $1,500. $1,500? Ha <laughs> I shall get it for you as soon as the banks open in the morning. Well, Herman, the time has come to say goodbye. But you will be back soon, won't you, Carl? As soon as I can clear up things in Vienna. But uh, just in case you know how uncertain travel is, uh, I, I want you to have this. What is it? My will. Your will? I have made you the heir to all I possess. My castle at Graz. My villa at Salzburg, my other lands in Hungary, my paintings and library. Oh, no, no, Carl, I couldn't. I... Should I die, minor lieber Freund, all I have is yours. Don't be the same. Oh, Jesus. Federal officers have a hold against him 
to deport him as an undesirable alien. And Scotland Yard has filed a hold against him to answer for his fraudulent representations to gullible Miss Mary Heatherstone of Shepton Heath. Whether Madame Durain, the royalist, will prefer charges remains to be seen. Thank you, Chief Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, your police officials do everything in their power to protect you and your property. That's why they use Rio Grande cracked gasoline in police cars, fire engines, and emergency vehicles. By actual tests, they have proved that Rio Grande cracked gasoline gives more speed, more power, and more miles to the gallon. City records of cars, operating costs, over a period of years, prove that it costs less per mile to use Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Won't you take a friendly tip from your police department? Try the same gasoline as they use. Rio Grande cracked gasoline with tetraethyl and enjoy police car performance in your own car. Another true crime story next week. For information about these programs, ask at any Rio Grande service station for a free copy of the Calling All Cars News, a unique publication with true detective stories and the latest movie and radio news. Illustrated in color, free at any service station where Rio Grande cracked gasoline is sold. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night.